Well, as you all know, we are, on Wednesday nights, we're dealing with a Christian doctrine. We're going through systematically all of the major Christian doctrines. Right now, we're addressing the doctrine of soteriology or the doctrine of salvation is what that is. And we're in a section where we are systematically uh, re- addressing and refuting what are sometimes referred to as the Calvinist proof texts. Ephesians 1, Romans 9, so on and so forth. And so that's where we should be tonight. However, I'm going to put that on pause for one week to address some of this eclipse hysteria. I probably should have done this last week, but I was just blissfully unaware of all this prophetic mania surrounding the eclipse until yesterday somebody showed me a clip from the Michael Knowles podcast. Many of you saw that. Several hands are going up, okay. Well, Michael Knowles interviewed a pastor, and I'm putting that in air quotes, okay, a pastor from right here in Texas in Burleson. So just not very far away from here even. And this interview, this pastor went on a, I I watched it, and I watched some other things about it, and it was like a 30-minute explanation of all the supposedly incredible things that God was trying to say to us through the timing and the trajectory of this celestial phenomenon. And beloved, as I I just have to say, as I watched it, I sat gobsmacked at the sheer silliness of it all. I I couldn't believe it. Uh, The prophetic misunderstanding was appalling. Even worse were this guy's hermeneutics, which I shudder to call them that. Uh, And perhaps most disturbing of all to me was what it suggests about so many of God's people that they could get caught up in that. And so tonight, I'm not going to spend forever, but I'm going to spend, I'm going to take a little bit of time to preach on, there's the title to the message, this is the prophetic insignificance of the eclipse. Okay? Okay, let's try this. Open your Bibles to Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12, let's stand together and read verses 39 and 40. Matthew 12, we'll start in verse 38. The Bible says, Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Which I find ironic because Jesus had just gotten through giving them so many signs, they didn't know what to do with them all. They always want one more. But anyway, he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, the reason I chose this text is because according to this pastor in our area, the eclipse was the sign of the prophet Jonas. But I want you to read the next verse. For as as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly... So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay. We should just pray and be done right now. But in any case, we're going to continue this. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come to you. And God, this is, it's so silly, but it's actually quite serious. And I pray that you'll help me to, to convey this um, properly, and, and truly, God, with grace, but also um, with truth. And so we, we pray for your help in both areas. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. 
Okay, now we're going to get to this text here in just a minute. But first, let me set this up. As I said a moment ago, I was not, I was not keeping up with all the sensationalism surrounding the eclipse. So I just, I was not aware of how much Christian attention this was garnering. And again, it wasn't until yesterday that I was shown this Michael Knowles video featuring this so-called pastor. His name is Troy Brewer. He's from Burleson. Now, I have since discovered that he not only shared his spiel there on the Michael Knowles podcast, but also in, in studio at the Daystar Network. Does everybody know about Daystar? Daystar is a rival to TBN. Okay. And so the Daystar Network, which is very famous, it's a notorious platform that hosts all sorts of charismatic frauds, including Benny Hinn, a fraud, including Jesse Duplantis, a fraud, Kenneth Copeland, a weird fraud. Okay. So the mere fact that he was on that station should have raised some red flags. Okay? Now, I mean, a broken clock is right twice a day, so you can't say that everything they say is wrong. But if you watch it on there, you should be careful. Okay? Nevertheless, Mr. Brewer has been all over social media, I found out, peddling the supposed prophetic significance of the eclipse. Now, before we tackle his claims, let me just say, I do not intend tonight my remarks to be a personal insult to Mr. Brewer, honestly. He may be a very nice man and seems like it. He may be sincere in his beliefs, and I, he says he is, so I'll take him at his word. Okay? I went to his website, and it says that his ministry is to rescue people from sexual traffic, trafficking. Now, if he's actually doing that, that's a noble thing. A wonderful thing. I'm not against that. But whether he does some things that are good or not is beside the point. The point is that in the main, because I, I read a lot of what he said, in the main and in this regard in particular, he is leading people astray and teaching them to approach the Bible in a horrific way. Okay? And sadly, it is not just a few people that are getting caught up in it. The interview that he did with Michael Knowles went viral. I mean, it was being shared all over the country. And Brother Jed told me he went somewhere just recently over in Fort Worth to do business. And when he walked up to the counter, uh, the two ladies who were there at the counter were, were addressing this very video. So, I mean, there's people in the popular culture that are, that are seeing this and, and talking about it. Christian people. Right, and on top of that, the whole reason that he was even invited to do that podcast was because he had already made a name for himself, I found out, because of this issue on other platforms. Millions of people saw him on Daystar. He released a 40-minute sermon that attracted widespread attention. Right? So I'm just saying his message was entering the popular consciousness in a very big way. And again, I'm not going to spend... Our waste our time refuting his nonsense point by point because it's really the assumptions. It's really the approach behind his conclusions that we need to address. However, let me just say a few things about his specific claims. And I want to start tonight with the hermeneutical problems. Does everyone understand what I mean by hermeneutics? In case that's a new word for you, hermeneutics is, is not a biblical word. It's just a, it's a word that that has to do with the science of interpretation, right? The rules by which we interpret any written document. These are rules that would apply to the newspaper or Time Magazine or whatever you're reading, including the Bible. These are the rules of interpretation, right? And they're standard. They vary slightly depending on genre. We don't interpret poems the same way we interpret narrative, the same way we interpret, you know, uh, legal documents. There are conventions for each one of those, but there are written down rules that everyone knows that control how we interpret things. And you cannot simply throw those rules out when you come to the Bible. All right. 
Now, at the very beginning of his most popular video, he says, quote, the eclipse, which he, now, again, he connects the eclipse to the sign of the prophet Jonah. I'm not going to go into all the reasons for that. But he says this, quote, it is the sign of the prophet Jonah. The eclipse, he says, is one of the greatest prophetic signs of our lifetime. And the warning that it conveys, he says, is very serious. Now, you might be asking yourself, why? Why is it very serious? Well, he says it is significant because it's happening on April 8th. So what? Well, what is special about April 8th? The true answer, of course, is that there's absolutely nothing significant about April 8th. Though, there's nothing significant about it whatsoever. Nevertheless, in his mind, it is special because of Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 8. I'd like you to go look at this. Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 8. And then let's just work our way through this. Exodus chapter 4. And I want you to notice what verse 8 says. It says, and it shall come to pass... That if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Okay. Now, what does this have to do anything with, or what does this have to do with anything, and, and what are the problems here? Well, unfortunately, there are some serious problems being smuggled into this. First, he is assuming that the eclipse that happened on Monday is the second sign. The first of which was the eclipse in 2017. He's claiming that the eclipse in 2017 was also a sign to the United States population and that we missed it. We didn't, we didn't hear God's voice then. But hopefully, we will pay attention to this sign. Now, let me ask you a question. Did you notice that in the text it says, notice verse 8 again. It says, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the second sign. Does it say anything there about hopefully they'll pay attention to the second one? No. It doesn't say hopefully. It says we will listen. So right off the bat, you can even see just from this much alone that his twisted application is playing fast and loose with the details. Did you notice that? Okay. Secondly, that is to say nothing of the fact that the eclipse in 2017 was not a sign. But those minor points aside, ask yourself, why did he pick Exodus 4.8 and not Genesis 4.8 or Jeremiah 4.8 or any of the other 65 books? Everybody understand? It's just totally ad hoc. You talk about cherry picking, you ever, everybody know what the sharpshooter's fallacy is? Sharpshooter's fallacy is like this. You have a barn in front of you, you pull out your six shooter and you go bang, 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 bang. You shoot six holes in the wall and then you walk up there and you draw the bullseye around where you hit. That's all he's done. Go to Leviticus 4.8. Leviticus 4 and verse 8, why didn't we pick this one? Probably because it says, and he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering and the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards. Boy, aren't you blessed now? Does everybody understand? If this is just totally ad hoc. There's no, nothing to this. Secondly, here's another problem. Go back to Exodus 4, 8. I should have told you to hold your place there. Look at this. You talk about the sell-by date has already passed. Wow. The sell-by date on Exodus 4.8 passed about 3,300 years ago. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Look, friends, we are not ancient Israelites. We are not living in Egypt awaiting our deliverance from slavery. This prophecy was fulfilled long ago in the story recorded in the book of Exodus. Amen. It has nothing whatsoever to do with us today. 
This is ridiculous. And third, and this is, this is simply not about us. Do you understand that every part of the Bible is profitable for us, but most of the Bible is not about us? It's not about us. It's for us. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. But it's not addressing us. And there are many passages and promises in Scripture that don't apply to you. They were made to other people. This is not about us. Mr. Brewer is simply out of context. Okay? He's, not only is he out of context, he's completely ignoring the context. Beloved, back up to the beginning of the chapter. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Look at verse 1. Who's, who is being addressed here? And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, God said, Cast it on the ground. And so Moses cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That was the first sign that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put forth his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his land was leprous as snow. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. That's the context. Does everybody understand? I mean, God was speaking to Moses, not America. The signs were not eclipses. It was the miraculous transformation of a lifeless wooden rod into a living serpent and the instantaneous contraction and then healing of leprosy. To apply this passage to the eclipse is absurd in the extreme. And really, this is one of the root problems. Mr. Brewer has made a, fundamental, a fundamental hermeneutical mistake. He is applying a text to a subject, that is to say, to a group of people or to a nation or to a, a person. He's applying it to someone that is not under consideration. Okay, he's reading a foreign group, a foreign subject, into the text, in this case, the United States. Friend, this is called eisegesis. There's a name for this. Eisegesis. And it's eisegesis at its absolute worst. We are supposed to do exegesis. Exegesis. Exegesis is to uncover and to bring out what is in the text. That eclipses are not in the text at all. But he is inserting his own ideas, ideas that are utterly foreign to the context in order to make his case. Everybody with me? This is ludicrous. And that, my friends, is what's wrong with his use of Matthew 12 and verse 39. Because contrary to this elaborate case, and I listened to the whole case that he made. We're off into the land of Lincoln and little Egypt and all this other stuff he's talking about. This is where the Civil War took place and this happened and that happened. And, it, and the eclipse passed over seven cities called Salem in 2017. And so God was trying to promise, seven, promise us seven years of peace. By the way, how'd that work out? And now he's warning us that if we don't repent in 40 days because the eclipse passes over seven cities called Nineveh. He said, I listened to him, he said, it's so incredible, you can't make this up, except I looked it up, and you can't, he did make it up. Yeah. He absolutely did make it up. There are not seven cities called Nineveh in the path of the eclipse, there are two. The whole thing is just stupid. I'm sorry, I said I wasn't going to insult him, but I'm, it is stupid. Look, contrary to this elaborate case he tries to make, the sign of the prophet Jonah in Matthew 12, 39 is defined in the immediate context. Jesus says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The sign of the prophet Jonah was not the sun going dark for three hours while Jesus was on the cross. The sign was his death, his burial, and his miraculous resurrection three days later. 
The whole approach to Scripture is ludicrous. And yet he goes on. Listen to this. Apparently, as he was first learning about the eclipse, this one in 2024, he learned about it apparently after the previous one, which I don't know why he waited that long. If he had gone back in 1972, they predicted this. Hello. But in any case, when he learned about it, Mr. Brewer prayed to God. Here's what he said. Quote, this is his words. Lord Jesus, what are you trying to say? And Jesus responded, quote, pay attention to where it enters in at. That's horrible grammar on Jesus' part, but we'll overlook that. The meaning, the meaning of Jesus' words seems to be, pay attention to the place from which the eclipse is first visible in the United States. Okay. As it turns out, the first city in the U.S. to see the eclipse was Eagle Pass, Texas. Not only, says Mr. Brewer, is that significant because of the border crisis going on there, but he suggests that there is a connection between Eagle Pass and Matthew 24, which is where the Lord Jesus discusses the events leading to his own return. And you say, well, how is Eagle Pass, Texas connected to Matthew 24? I, want, I can't wait to show this to you. Go to Matthew 24. I kid you not. This is, this is the connection. Look in Matthew 24 and verse 28. According to Mr. Brewer, Jesus... <laughs> You got there before I did, didn't you? Look at this. According to Mr. Brewer, Jesus pointed to the significance of the eclipse because it's coming to Eagle Pass, Texas. And in verse 28, Jesus said, Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Wow. I feel like when I, when I heard this, honestly, the thing that came to my mind, you know how things come to your mind from, from commercials or from movies you've seen? I felt like Woody from the first Toy Story. Because he says, the words that I'm looking for, I can't say because there are preschool toys present. I mean, this is just so ridiculous, it's embarrassing. This is embarrassing. Apart from the word eagle, there is literally no connection whatsoever between Eagle Pass, Texas and Matthew 24. The logic used to associate these two things is bizarre. How many have heard the old joke? Brother Noah sent this to me. How many of you have heard this old joke about uh, why fire trucks are red? You ever heard this? A guy asks his buddy, why are fire trucks red? And his friend responds, well, because fire trucks have eight wheels and four people on them and eight plus four is 12. And 12 inches is a foot and a foot is a ruler. And Queen Elizabeth was a ruler, and Queen Elizabeth was a ship, and the ship sailed in the seas, and seas have fish in them, and fish have fins, and the fins fought the Russians, and the Russians are red, and fire trucks are always rushing around. So there you have it. That's why fire trucks are red. <laughs> Dear friends, it is so wrong you can't even keep up with all the mistakes in it. And you talk about, listen, you talk about bringing reproach upon the name of Christ, this comedy of errors is so absurd. It, it should be beneath the dignity, let alone the intellect, of all truly born-again Christians. Uh, right now, today, you should see the text threads going around and the, on Facebook and all these people mocking about oh, Christians, where's the rapture now? How'd that work out for you? I mean, this is ridiculous. Now, in addition to Mr. Brewer's hermeneutical malfeasance, can we agree his hermeneutics are bad? His so-called prophetic warnings also constitute, listen to me, an attack on the sufficiency of Scripture. Now, I would really like to camp out here. This is my favorite subject, as you know. But let's just go back to his claim. When first learning about the eclipse, he asked, quote, Lord Jesus, what are you trying to say? 
And Jesus, he claims, responded, pay attention to where it enters in at. Now, I want you to notice that not only is Mr. Brewer, again, he's viewing the Bible through a red, white, and blue lens, which does not exist, hello. But even worse, I want you to watch this. He is putting words in God's mouth that God did not say. Amen. God did not say. Now, again, I realize, now I, I know who I'm talking to. I realize that you know where we stand. But I understand also the culture in which we live in, and I know how common it is to hear Christians spout off about all the things that God has supposedly said. The most powerful words in the English language are, God told me. And people use this all the time. Oh, I was reading my Bible and God told me, or I was doing this and God told me, or I saw this and I, you know, I was about to go through an intersection and God just told me to slow down and then there was an accident and it didn't happen. God told me this and God told me that and we hear God told me this and God told me the other thing 24-7 and I'm here to tell you tonight, brethren, none of that is true. Right. Should you hear me again? Not one word of that is true. I don't care if it's the missionary on Sunday. I don't care if it's a pastor that you like or don't like. None of that is true. None of that is true. God speaks in one place and one place only. And that's it right there. There is not another way. God speaks through the spirit-inspired pages of his word. And to even dare to claim otherwise is outrageous. That is not historic biblical Christianity. It is not. And here's, here's, watch me now. In light of Deuteronomy 18 and verse 20, people like Mr. Brewer should be trembling before God to even utter such nonsense. Go with me to Deuteronomy 18. Let's read what the Bible actually says. You want to know why people don't take Christianity seriously? It is because of this kind of nonsense. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 20. Look at what God says. He says, but the prophet, the person who claims to be a prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of the other gods, even that prophet shall what? That's what it says. And then in verses 21 and 22, Moses goes on to answer the obvious question. If thou say in thine heart, well, how will we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Here's a good way. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So, dear friends, can we just acknowledge tonight that if someone says God told me to do X and then X doesn't come out, turn out the way that they claim, they're a false prophet. They're claiming to speak on behalf of God something that God did not say. Hello? So, now I'm not suggesting that we go find Mr. Brewer and stone him, okay? So I don't want anybody claiming that I'm inciting to violence or anything like that. But I think we can dismiss him as a buffoon. This is not true. We can dismiss him and all the others who claim stuff that God told them. God does not speak except through the pages of his word. Amen. And if you claim otherwise... You better look out. You are, you, are, you are a false prophet. You have no credibility. None whatsoever. I, I would really like to camp out here because I really think that, at, that at, this is the heart of the problem. This is where all this stuff actually goes back to. The idea that God speaks to individuals personally and gives them information that is not available in Scripture is dangerous and unbiblical. Amen. Amen. The notion that God speaks to us through events such as an eclipse or a car crash or the death of a loved one 
or cloud shapes that people saw in the sky. Those are all, listen, here's the problem. They are subjective. They are open to as many different interpretations as there are observers of the events. They are open to interpretations that are utterly foreign to New Testament Christianity, and therefore they have no place in the life of God, or in the life of the child of God, rather. Does everybody understand with me? If someone says, well, I just know God wants me to do X because such and such happened. I can look at such and such and say, no, he wants you to do Y. And you say, well, I don't think so. Well, I do think so. Well, I don't think so. Well, I do think so. Well, which one of us is right? There is no objective way to settle that dispute. God doesn't speak to us that way. Events are ambiguous. The text is clear. We don't have to have, listen, we do not need the eclipse to know Jesus is coming soon. Amen. We do not need the eclipse to know that this nation is sinful and under the ju coming judgment of God. That's all in the Bible. Amen. If extra revelations agree with the Bible, they're unnecessary. If they disagree with the Bible, they're wrong. Amen. Is everybody with me? We don't need anything else but the word of God. And just stop and think about where this idea that God speaks to us privately apart from the scripture, think about where that leads. Anytime you leave the door open to the possibility that God is trying to communicate with you through events, as Mr. Brewer does, then you are immediately faced with the problem that you have no way to discern which interpretation is legitimate and which one is just your silly opinion. It doesn't work and God does not do that. Amen. Amen. If we just had that down, you would never have to listen to another one of these things ever again. As soon as somebody says, God showed me, just walk away. And that point leads right into a third problem, which, as I said at the beginning, is perhaps the worst of all. Because, beloved, the only way that this guy or any other of these charismatic hucksters can get away with this nonsense is because of the biblical ignorance of their followers. You to listen to me tonight. The vast majority of professing Christians are almost completely biblically illiterate. And that's terrible. But something else may be even worse. Because listen to me, it seems to me that many Christians, even if they are not totally ignorant, are in some way unsatisfied with what God has already given. They're unsatisfied with what God has already said. And so what they're actually looking for is some new fantastic feeling of connection with God. It's almost like they're spiritual adrenaline junkies. They're constantly searching for a new high. Brethren, this is no way to live. My connection with God is not special now because I think, wow, we're right on the cusp of this prophetic event. Okay. Do you understand tonight that our joy in the Lord does not come from constantly living on the edge of our seat as we watch the unfolding of the end times play out on our television screens? Dear friends, our joy as Christians comes from abiding in Christ. It comes from spending time in fellowship with him. Our joy comes from obeying the clear commands of scripture and knowing that with such God is well pleased. I'm afraid there's a deep, listen, I'm afraid that at the root of all this, there is a deep spiritual anemia. That's what's driving all this sensationalism and the relentless pursuit to find significance in something outside of and beyond scripture. We don't need that. Now, in closing, I want to deal with one last issue that I think will inoculate us against any future hoaxes like this. Let's actually see Matthew 24 in context. Go with me there. This is the passage that is, and it's parallel passages in Mark and Luke. This is the passage that is commonly used to teach all kinds of stuff. And to find 
if you watch the internet, you would think prophecy is being fulfilled every 30 seconds. Okay? It's just not true. I want you to, now look, Matthew 24 is a somewhat disputed passage, even amongst premillennial, pre tribulational scholars, okay? It's somewhat disputed. Among futurists, now we're going to get into actual exegesis here, okay? So no more weird stuff. Among futurists like me, I'm a futurist, which means that I believe that the events described in Matthew 24 are future. Okay? I believe that the book of the Revelation is future. We haven't already accomplished it. We're not living in the kingdom now. That stuff is future. Now, among futurists like me, conservative, premillennial, pre-tribulational folks like me, some of them believe that verses 4 to 14 refer to what is called the inter-advent age. Okay? What is the inter-advent age? The advent was 2,000 years ago when Jesus came for the first time. The next advent is when he returned to rule as king. And so the inter-advent age is now. That's what we call the church age. Okay? So some of them believe that these events recorded in Matthew 24 refer to the inter-advent age. Others believe that verses 4 to 14, especially verses 4 to 8, refer to the first half of the tribulation and that they correspond with the first four seal judgments of Revelation 6, verses 1 through 8. Now look, look up here, listen to me. If, I don't want to go into all the details right this second, but if the inter-advent view is correct, in other words, if verses 4 to 14 refer to the church age and describe the time in which we're living, if, if that's the case, then it means that when we see wars and earthquakes and famines and the appearance of false Christs, those things should, should be constantly increasing as we approach the tribulation. Everybody with me? And you commonly hear that, don't you? That's commonly taught. However, if these items are references to the first half of the tribulation, then it follows that wars and earthquakes and famines and false Christs during any part of the church age, whether long ago or even today, those things would not constitute any sort of prophetic sign. Are you with me? I'm going to make sure everybody's nodding their head like you follow me, okay? So the question is, which view is correct? Well, let's see. I want you to put a finger in Matthew 24 and another finger in Revelation 6, where you can turn back and forth quickly and look. This is not hard to adjudicate. All we have to do is go look. Let's compare Matthew 24 with Revelation 6, and you can see for yourself whether these things line up or not. In Matthew 24, what is the first sign listed in Matthew 24? Verse 5 lists what? False messiahs. Right? False messiahs. But what is the first sign listed in Revelation 6? Flip over there. Surprise, surprise. In verse 2, the first seal, when it is opened, is also a messianic pretender on a white horse carrying a bow, unlike Jesus, who comes in chapter 19 with a sword. Who is this man on the white horse that comes at the first seal? We know it's the Antichrist. We spent weeks dealing with this. What about the second sign? Well, and since we're in Revelation, look down in verse 3 and 4. Revelation 6, verse 3 says that the second seal, look at it. It says, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All right? So war breaks out. You have the Antichrist first, followed by the outbreak of war. Well, what about Matthew 24? Go back there and look in verse 6. There, Jesus says in verse 6, and ye shall hear of what? Wars. wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. What do you have there? 
war, international conflict. Okay? So again, we have wars and major conflict. After that, look what Matthew adds. There shall be what's next? Famines. Famines. Go back to Revelation 6. The third seal in Revelation 6. He says, and I beheld... <clears throat> The third beast say, come and see, verse 5, and I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Again, as we dealt with in great detail in our series in Revelation, it's describing famine and terrible inflation where it costs a whole day's wages to have one tiny meal, Right? The fourth seal in Revelation 6 is, verse 8, Death, I behold a pale horse, and him that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power is given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Right? The fourth seal is death and all kinds of pestilence, whether it's from man or it's from wild beasts or it's from rodents running rampant and disease, all these things, pestilence which turns out to be exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 7. And by the way, because look in Matthew 24 and verse 7, Jesus says, there shall be famines and then pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And the correspondence continues. The fifth in both lists is persecution and martyrdom, followed by the sixth, which is earthquakes and cosmic phenomenons. Beloved, the two passages, look up here, please. These two passages track identically with each other. They track identically. And yet, watch please, we know for sure that the events of Revelation, described in Revelation 6, take place after the rapture. We, we know for sure that they are in the time frame of the tribulation. Which means, according to Daniel 9, 24 through 27, that the, that the Antichrist on earth has already signed the seven-year covenant with Israel. He's already been identified. The tribulation is going on. Is everybody understanding? These events are not part of the inner advent age. They belong to the future seven-year tribulation time frame. Okay? And so for that reason... I believe that Matthew chapter 24, let's go back there, verses 4 all the way down to verse 41, they likewise, because they're directly parallel, they likewise refer to the tribulation. Those are not things that are happening now. They are future events. And as you know, go back to, Revelation, or to Matthew 24. Look at it again. As you well know, Matthew 24 is, or the tribulation, rather, is divided into two parts of three and a half years apiece, the first and the second half. And those two halves are divided by, what's the midpoint? The abomination of desolation. And notice what Jesus says in verse 15. Matthew 24 and verse 15, he, he describes all these things that parallel precisely with, with Revelation 6. And then in verse 15, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then flee to the mountains, verse 16, okay? So, what I'm getting at is this. In Matthew 24, verses 4 to 14 refers to the first half of the tribulation. And it parallels the first five seal judgments found in Revelation 6. Now, in Matthew 24, look in verse 8. You'll notice in verse 8 that Jesus characterizes the events that he's just talked about in verses 4 through 7. He calls them the beginning of what? Sorrows. The word that is translated sorrows in Greek means it's birth pangs. If you look up the word, it's the pain of childbirth. It's travail, birth pain. Most likely, Jesus had in mind here a reference to the Old Testament passage in Jeremiah 30, verses 6 and 7, which asks this. Listen to it. He says, ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Apparently, God doesn't believe that men get pregnant. Anyway, ask now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore, though, do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Here's why. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. In other words, this time of the 
pains of childbirth as related to Israel is this time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. Okay? Now, Dr. Randall Price explains these birth pangs this way. Quote, Jesus' statement of the birth pangs is specifically that the events of the first half of the tribulation are merely the beginning with the expectation of greater birth pains in the second half. And he bases it on this analogy. The entire period of, the, watch this please. The entire period of the 70th week is like birth pangs. Just as a woman must endure the entire period of labor before giving birth, so Israel must endure the entire seven-year tribulation before Jesus comes. The time divisions of tribulation are also illustrated by the figure. For just as the natural process intensifies toward delivery, so here the tribulation moves progressively toward the second advent, which takes place in Matthew 24 immediately after the tribulation ends in verse 29. So he says, as there are two phases of the birth pangs, so the seven years of tribulation are divided between the less severe and the more severe experiences of terrestrial and cosmic wrath as revealed in the Olivet Discourse and the judgments of Revelation 6. Now, is everybody with me about this? Does this make sense? It's so simple. Now, people ask me, I, I've been asked this a lot. Do you believe that the events like these earthquakes that are happening and famines and wars and so on, do you think that means that we're that the end is near? And here's my answer. No. Now that might surprise some people. Cuz they often hear from prophecy teachers that all of these things have current prophetic significance. But as you can see, the events of Matthew 24, 4 through 8 do not refer to the church age and therefore they are not precursors to the rapture. They happen within the tribulation itself. So, while it is likely that, yes, we stand on the verge of tribulation events, because we can see the one world economy and the one world government and the one world religion taking shape, we are not yet in that time frame. Hello. The rapture has not happened. Israel has not signed. The, the Antichrist has not been revealed. He's not signed the covenant with them. We're not in the tribulation. And therefore, since Matthew 24 cannot happen until after that, it is wrong to say that all these events are prophetically significant in our own day. So when you hear Troy Brewer or anybody else talk about all this stuff, they just, they're just wrong. The birth pangs do not start until Israel faces her time of trouble. Is everybody with me tonight? I hope so. Because if you are, you will never again be swept up in the apocalyptic fever running rampant and being promoted by these charlatans. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, that's all I wanted to say tonight. I just wanted to clear that up, make sure that we're all straight. But before we're dismissed, uh, Brother Jed's going to come in just a second. We're going to sing a chorus to be dismissed. But before that, I want to show you a two-minute video that summarizes everything, and then we'll be done. Okay? Hey, remember those four blood moons prophecies in the 2010s? John Hagee wrote a best-selling book. There was even a theatrical film. And what happened? Absolutely nothing. Did a single false prophet lose their job after that? And here we are again with another eclipse and more wannabe prophets saying Jesus is coming soon, even though the Bible already says that. Let's just put this to rest right here. Natural solar eclipses are never mentioned in the Bible. They are not prophetic signs of anything. And don't let the YouTube and TikTok prophets tell you otherwise, no matter how many millions of views they have. But Gabe, haven't you heard that the great solar eclipse of 2017 passed over seven cities named Salem, which is short for Jerusalem? So what? Jerusalem is in the Middle East, not the United States, and neither that eclipse nor this one are visible there, or by most people on the earth. But Gabe, haven't you heard that the great solar eclipse of 2024 is going to pass over seven cities named Nineveh? Not true. The total eclipse is going to pass over two cities named Nineveh, and it will be partially visible from another five. By the way, the eclipse will be at least partially visible everywhere in the U.S. But Gabe, haven't you heard that both eclipses cross over a town called Rapture, Indiana? 
No, it's an unincorporated town called Rapture, and the Total Eclipse was not seen there in 2017, but will be in 2024. And this has no prophetic significance. Again, solar eclipses are naturally occurring. An Ohio newspaper from 1970 reported the eclipse in 2024. We can calculate when they will happen. But Jesus said no one will know the hour or the day of his return. Enjoy an eclipse for the beauty that it is. For Psalm 19.5 says that the sun runs its course with joy as God made the sun and the moon to run like clockwork. This is not a sign of the end, but you do still need to repent and turn to Christ for judgment will come at an hour you do not expect when we understand the text. Let's stand together.